All right, so I'm working for Moscow and we pride ourselves with excellence in scrapping solutions, all right? So uh, during today's lecture, um, I'm speaking to you from hot and humid Singapore. I've been living here for the past 11 years. Um, I'm currently fulfilling the role at Moscow Group as a global director for purchasing and procurement, but I'm also directly responsible for two manufacturing plants in Malaysia. All right, so Malaysia is basically just across the border from here. I mean, especially our plants, but uh, thanks to the pandemic, it seems like light years away. So yeah, CSR, uh, corporate social responsibility. To me, and I think to many other people in the field, we consider CSR to be a subset of sustainability, all right? CSR is more towards the opinion formers whereas sustainability addresses the whole value chain. Interestingly, I had the same guest lecture in, uh, I think, 2007, 2008 uh, in uni uh, with the uh, CSR manager of Daimler, Germany. And during that lecture, what always was, uh, what always was bugging me was the question, what is CSR actually good for? Isn't it just PR, really? And uh, I think it boils down to the very basic and rather philosophical question, is altruism real or is it just an illusion? So I would like you all to keep this in mind, this question, and uh, you know, keep it in mind while I present and we will discuss it towards the end of my presentation, right? So let's jump right to the syllabus. So um, I first want to give you a short profile of Moscow. So it's really going to be more of an elevator pitch. I'm not going to go into too many, especially technical details. Uh, then a brief summary of uh, the stages of my professional life. And then we get to the uh, nitty gritty part of theoretics. So the basics of sustainability, ESG, three pillars, and how they apply to an SME in champion. Um, here we could have a small break if you want, but it's not, it's not mandatory. Uh, the next part then would be our journey to sustainability. In a nutshell, it would be like where, where we, when we started the project, how did we identify our position on the global sustainability landscape? And how did we determine uh, to shape our future efforts? All right. Uh, under number five, strategy and implementation. That's really the practical application of what we learned before. So after our first findings, we had um, a group-wide uh, workshop and discussed with uh, certain representatives within our organization the uh, actual impact of our uh, sustainability strategy. Then uh, number six would be the bigger picture, I call it. That's uh, beyond our company. It's more about society and government, all right, and uh, politics and association. Uh, and I want to round up uh, my little session here with your conclusions and then ask me anything. All right. So, short profile, Moscow. Who are we and what do we do? So Moscow is really a true blue German Mittelstand company, whereas Mittelstand can, of course, be defined as SME company, small, medium-sized enterprise. But when it's like in Germany, there's like certain other implications so in many ways, we are a hidden champion of our industry, whereas our industry itself is very niche, right? So when people ask me, uh, what do you do in your company? Basically, I'm showing this. So we don't do the carton uh, box. That would be too easy. We do the plastic straps, which I try to highlight here, um, around the box, all right? So whenever you get some mail order, in many times um, you will get uh, a box, yeah, strapped with plastic. All right. So we kind of also piggyback um, on the carton box industry, which is huge and also relatively sustainable. Um, keep in mind, cardboard boxes or carton boxes have a recycling rate of ninety-six percent, while at the same time, eighty percent of all products, like any products. Uh, in transit are moved at least once in a cardboard box during the life cycle. But there's more to it, all right? We call this minimum impact packaging and we have various application possibilities. 
So for once, of course, the closing and securing of boxes, then a bundling of single units of products can be used as a handling aid. And then uh, the bigger solution here would be load securing, whereas we put boxes on the pallet and then secure by strapping the products to the pallet. So first and foremost, Moscow is actually a, an engineering uh, and machine manufacturing company. So we have different machines, systems, integrated solutions, but also a big part of our business is actually the strapping material. So producing plastics. Now to visualize, especially the machinery part, I just quickly want to jump to um, YouTube and show you a little video, which uh, yeah, demonstrates what we really do and how it looks like. So this is a video which was produced uh, together with our strategic partner in Japan, that's Fuji Hisoku. So if you see here, and I will skip through a little bit, that's basically uh, an integrated solution. So in the very far right here, that's the first machine over here. And before that would be a carton box production machine, right? They're very fancy, they're very uh, high tech, uh, but of course, to deal with the output, they need a very reliable uh, processing machine behind, all right? And that's this machine here. This machine was in particular developed for this industry. So uh, here you can see those are stacked boxes. So they're folded, yeah, they're folded. So they're not unfolded, it's stacked folded boxes coming into our machine. In the machine, they are strapped, okay? So we apply, in this case, two plastic straps to each box, which you can see here. And this bundles the boxes. All right, let's skip a little bit. Especially through this. Okay, once they're stacked, they go to our partner's area. So they use a robot to stack the stacked boxes onto a pallet. Yeah, that's how it looks like. I will assume we get the principal. So once these boxes are stacked, they leave the robotics area. And enter an alignment station um, where you push the stacks together so they're neatly aligned. Uh, very simple machinery, rather trivial here. All right, once they are aligned, the pallet will enter the next Moscow machine. So this is a pallet strapping machine. Now we secure the stacked boxes onto a pallet, again by strapping. So that's two straps on one side. Then we turn the whole pallet by 90 degrees. And we strap them again. And now at this point here, give me a sec, right here, uh, I want to talk a little bit about our USB. So this uh, obscure looking item is a ceiling head. All right, and this is one of our USPs is patented, and this is what really enabled a lot of our sustainability efforts. So traditionally, seven second. Traditionally, all right. So this is the lower part of the strap. That's the upper part. Traditionally, you would put a heating element in here, and then melt the plastics, and then just apply pressure so that the melted parts join. All right, but what we do. From below, we have a so-called um, ultrasonic emitter. So now we emit a very high frequency um, ultrasonic wave, which joins the straps on a molecular level. So basically it breaks the molecular chains and realigns them. 
And therefore, we have a very, very strong joint. Apart from that, of course, we don't have to deal with fumes that obviously occur if you do plastic, and we don't have to deal with excess heat. I will get back to this a little bit later because it really plays a big role in our program. All right, once this is done. Pellet leaves the system and then is picked up uh, and will be ready for shipping. So either in a, uh, you know, in a sea freight container or on the truck or whatnot, all right? Jumping back to the presentation then. All right, um, the industries uh, we are currently serving or how we split them, one would be, uh, of course, corrugated cardboard and um, corrugated cardboard uh, and the paper industry, what we were looking at right now, then um, mail order and logistics. So obviously that could be a big mail order company, if you will come to mind, and also logistics in general, um, such as pharmaceuticals, electronics and other um, related industries. Next would be uh, construction and container, which is mostly for roof and floor tiles, timber, etc. Uh, then uh, food and beverages, which I would say is rather self-explanatory. And then lastly, newspaper and graphics industry, which used to be very substantial, but since the early 2000s, uh, of course, um, it lost significance due to the intended age. Right, our company and numbers. So uh, Moscow was founded in 1966 in Germany. Um, by now we have 26 uh, companies worldwide through which we achieve a turnover of 182 millions, and uh, we employ 1,000 people around the world. And uh, just to give you like a rough understanding of how many machines and systems we produce, last year it was 2,800. Okay, I think that was a good elevator pitch. Now, I just wanna quickly and briefly talk about myself. So I was born in 1983 in uh, Abbach Hessen, which is like one and a half drive away from Mannheim. Uh, after high school, I did not start uh, uni. I did a vocational training as TMSD Kaufmann at Moscow. Thereafter, I assumed my first role as a sales and marketing controller at HQ. So that was mostly like big data analysis, uh, market and competitive intelligence, and global analysis of revenue and profit streams. Um, at the same time, I conducted part time studies at the Corporate State University in Mannheim. The, uh, formerly BA or now DHBW. I studied international business and uh, in the class of 2009. So my bachelor thesis was actually competitive intelligence and packaging market potential analysis via demographics. I really didn't get too good of a grade, but it helped my employer to understand global potentials in our position in the market. This in turn led uh, to the revelation that our revenues in Asia were not where they should be, and that there was a huge untapped market potential. Hence, what did I do? I moved to Singapore to change that. Clever, right? So uh, in 2010, I assumed the role as managing director of the local companies, and I was directly responsible for the market expansion in Asia. So uh, the job, of course, was highly focused on revenues, results, and uh, market position means creating market alliances with strategic partners, and last but not least, closing deals. So it was quite a high energy life, always chasing the next big deal, always chasing the money. Um, then after that, I would say I needed a little bit of a hiatus. Uh, so I changed to self-employment from uh, 15 to 20, and I was involved in airport construction in Indonesia. Uh, then I returned to the Moscow Group in 2020 as director of the two production facilities uh, we have in Malaysia, but also as group director for global purchasing and procurement. And lastly, I was appointed as executive commissioner for sustainability in July 2020. And yeah, I really got to admit, I have never considered myself to be a sustainability guy. I have not paid much attention to it for the longest part of my professional life because I simply didn't really need it. So I found it somewhat difficult to get into it. And what do you do if you have problems like that? I mean, when you question yourself, like why sustainability? How do I tackle this? Well, I called up a close buddy of mine, um, like he studied me in, uh, in um, 
the DHBW Mannheim, and he chose a different path. So he uh, earned his PhD at the uh, Uni Frankfurt, became an assistant professor there for sustainability in HRM. So when I told him that uh, I was appointed for sustainability, he was laughing and laughing and laughing and laughing a little bit more. And then after 10 minutes, he stopped laughing. And then he started, you know, leading me through the theoretics and opened my eyes to sustainability itself, how sustainable Mosca already is and where we can achieve quick wins and what would be the uh, different perspectives and stances we have to assume in future. Sounds easy, but it's a lot easier than done. All right, this is where we come to the basic assumption and the theoretics of sustainability. So in all simplicity, uh, these are the notes to the interview I had with my friend, all right? So in a corporate environment, Sustainability means the avoidance of the depletion of resources in order to maintain a long lasting balance. Usually that's split into the three pillars of uh, sustainability. So one could say social, which is to improve the so situation of social cultural groups affected by the value added chain of the company. Ecological, sustain natural resources and reduce the impact of the company's operations on nature. And lastly, which is a bit of a paradox, economical, create a systemic approach which allows stakeholders to strive economically while reducing negative impacts on resources, natural or otherwise. Uh, you will also um, hear the term ESG a lot, which stands for environmental, social, governance, which roughly translates into the same three pillars. Okay, um, so. All these three pillars need to be tangible. That means we need to measure them uh, through KPIs. And we have to conduct internal and external benchmarking. Internal being like within the different entities we have and external um, as compared to the, um, well, to the best practice in the industry, but also to the average in the industry. And this should all um, culminate in the uh, sustainability report to engage stakeholders, all right? So the uh, sustainability report includes, but is not limited to carbon footprint, sustainability statement and targets, deployed measures and the predicted course, all right? For non-listed companies, uh, this uh, sustainability report is not necessarily binding. There's no mandatory format. However, it's very preferably to at least uh, use the GRI standards. So that's the global reporting initiative. So in a nutshell, the sustainability report helps us to conceptualize, visualize, and demonstrate our sustainability efforts. So uh, in Moscow terms, let's speak about social responsibility. And here we'll always distinguish between what we already had, what uh, were the quick wins and the low hanging fruits, and where we had to put some more effort in. So first of all, um, the code of conduct. All right, which is basically a written set of standards for internal application, internal policies, and external applications to our external partners along the chain. So definitely um, includes the fair treatment of employees and inclusion of minorities. It uh, addresses human rights, uh, as well as health, safety, and environment guidelines, anti-corruption, and fair contracts. So all these standards existed in our company in one way or another. And quite frankly, I believe that such standards should be the intrinsic values of every reasonable human being. And uh, yeah, I, I call it quick win because since we had it all, one way or another, it helped us to formalize the step very quickly. Then uh, the next complex of topics uh, was compliance, due diligence, and CSR. So in terms of compliance and due diligence, so. Um, we will be conducting internal and external compliance audits of uh, our value-added chains. We will uh, deploy risk management. We actually already have a risk management matrix uh, to understand human rights risks in our different um, regional, uh, yeah, regional areas of operation. And lastly, and this is what Moscow already had in place, uh, quite a substantial budget for CSR projects in terms of donations, sponsoring, et cetera. So Moscow has always uh, supported initiatives in terms of infrastructure development and sponsoring of third world countries, such as financing schools, 
water, uh, water wells and all these things. Then lastly, uh, oftentimes overlooked, the brand. We are family owned. Um, our company bears the name of the founder, Mr. Mosca. So we are committed to long-term partnerships with our stakeholders. Also, we're committed to sustainable development of the locations of our operations and the respective, uh, respective communities surrounding those locations. Now, ecological sustainability. So some uh, 10 plus years ago, we introduced a sub branding, which uh, is called Get Inside, that's green efficiency technology. And there we focus on energy saving technologies and the use of recycled and bio-based raw materials. Next would be the Sonic Stack, what I just showed you in that little video. This technology allows almost zero emissions in terms of heat and fumes, but also it enables the usage of lighter consumables and therefore minimum impact packaging concepts. Lastly, also a very important point, which is already deployed, energy management. So for example, um, our manufacturing plant in Germany um, is fully equipped with solar panels and not only do we power our plant through the solar power, but we also uh, relay excess power to the communal grid. And we constantly strive to um, you know, optimize our plants energetically. In terms of economical sustainability, I want to highlight one particular part here, which is the TCO focus, all right? TCO is the total cost of ownership concept. And I think this is overall quite important for German SMEs because relative, I mean, usually German SMEs or their products have a relative high purchasing price due to R&D and all the patents that go into it. However, with TCO, we want to prove that in the long run, the machinery totally offsets the initial costs through better uptime, less maintenance and higher performance. Product life cycle. Of course, we try to optimize our life cycles. Our machines are not to be used and then scrapped. We try to avoid replacement. We try to upgrade them. We try to minimize spare parts consumption. At the same time, we use optimized materials and components to reduce uh, wear and tear effects. Then in terms of R&D, we always allocate a certain budget within R&D dedicated to green technologies. Also, we conduct R&D audits to detect optimizable technologies in the green context. And again, this kind of ties back to the brand part, governance, we are family owned, completely family owned. So there's no influence of outside capital holders. So there's no such situation where we're gonna sell off uh, parts of the company for a quick buck, not gonna happen. All right, uh, so this is where I would suggest a break, but I think uh, it should be still okay. No I says think, anything. I think it's fine, yeah. All righty, all right. Then let's talk about our journey towards formalized sustainability. So the contents of this section um, are derived from our cooperation with two very renowned experts in the field of sustainability. That would be, uh, on the one hand, Professor Dr. Rainer Griesamer, and on the other hand, Mr. Talmundson. Professor Dr. Rainer Griesamer, um, he is an executive board member of the Öko Institute, uh, and he's the founder of the Future Heritage Foundation, in German Zukunftserbe. He was awarded the German Environmental Award of the German Federal Environmental Foundation in 2011. He's got quite an extensive uh, Wikipedia page, so if you want to check it out later on, please do. And then uh, Mr. Münzing, uh, he's the CEO and founder of the sustainability consulting firm called One Transformation, having worked with institutions such as the uh, Deutsche Energieagentur, the German Energy uh, Agency, Welthungerhilfe, and the uh, GIZ, GIZ, Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, the uh, Association for International Cooperation. So we will now be talking about carbon footprint, global sustainability principles, and sustainable targets. So the first step of our endeavor here was to detect our carbon footprint. So our total carbon footprint was 76 
1,500 metric tons in 2019. So now you can see this little map here. Um, so you, the Canada machinery is 667 tons. Um, USA consumables 38k tons, Germany 18 or 19k tons in consumables, 7.5k tons in uh, machinery, and then all the smaller uh, production facilities in Malaysia with consumables of 6.5 tons, uh, 6.5k tons in machinery of 3.2k tons. Interestingly, uh, the sales subsidiaries we have worldwide only um, emit 1.1k tons of um, CO2. So we took 2019 as a baseline. Okay. So uh, we took 2019 as a, a baseline year uh, because um, we definitely considered 2020 due to the pandemic to be, um, you know, it would dilute our results or our, our statement. And we're currently preparing the carbon footprint uh, assessment for 2021. So what does that mean? So basically, if you look at carbon footprints, um, you split them into scope one, two, and three, all right? And we speak about CO to E. So that's carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. So that's basically uh, greenhouse gases. So it could be nitrous oxide, methane, sulfur, tetrafluoride, et cetera, et cetera, all right? And in scope one, uh, we are only looking on emissions generated through operating our company facilities and our company vehicles. Then in scope two, we are also including the purchased electricity, heating and cooling for own usage. Scope three, where well, we can say that our scope three is someone else's scope one. Unfortunately, it is a little bit beyond our control because we can currently cannot influence how our customers will handle our products at the end of the life cycle. So this will require a lot of lobbying and work with association and government bodies. As it stands right now, yeah, as I said, scope three is difficult for us to influence. However, certain regulatory measures have or will kick in soon, such as carbon taxation or taxation of non-recycled and single-use plastics. This will help us tremendously in the future. And it will be necessary because if you see, that's our split. In scope one, we're only like at around 8K uh, tons. Scope two, at around 15.6K tons. But scope three is a whopping 53K tons. Now, we will be looking at global emission curves, benchmark targets, and scenarios, okay? As I said before, our carbon footprint is the baseline from which we derive our targets. This chart here shows different benchmark targets and the predicted effect. It demonstrates how we would need to shape our strategy to be in line with certain targets, all right? So we are here with our 76.5 tons, but the curves are actually like derived from from global circumstances. So the first curve, uh, which is called business as usual, which means, um, yeah, and it all breaks are off, we just continue to grow and to, you know, emit more and more CO2e. Uh, this will lead to a global rise in temperature by four degrees C in 2100. And this would have, have catastrophic effects and probably a very dramatic end of life as we know it well before 2100. The next curve in a slightly, uh, slightly lighter red is what we call current efforts. So that means um, all average global targets set out by governments and corporations. Um, but even this will lead to a global temperature rise by 2.7% in 2100 and probably will also lead to irreversible damage to climate and environment. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the Paris Agreement of 2015, and that is related to the IPCC targets. So the IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So the Paris Agreement of 2015, uh, it was actually launched in 16, but um, it was determined that we have to keep the rise of global temperature below 2 degrees C. Ideally, the limit should be 1.5 degrees C. 
The IPCC goes a bit further and its fixed target is below 1.5 degrees C. This will limit the frequency and intensity of climate events to more or less the current state we experience. Still not great, but it is something. Then the dark green curve you see here, those are the uh, European Union targets. I mean, you might uh, have read about it uh, in the last couple of months. So they now want to achieve net zero carbon by 2050, all right? And then from there on out, reverse the effects, all right? And then there's the even more ambitious targets, which you can see here in this kind of yellow greenish curve. Uh, that's Apple and IKEA. So they want to become carbon positive by 2030. So that means by 2030, they want to become carbon neutral, but then also start even earlier to reverse the effects the operations have had thus far on environment. Now, for us, um, I mean, this was basically the uh, bottom down approach. And now we were looking with our um, experts into the bottom up approach. What can Mosca do uh, in terms of CO2 E reductions in scopes one and two? We can switch to photovoltaic completely. And uh, I can say that our new production plant, uh, and we're currently expanding in Malaysia, so our new production plant in uh, Malaysia will be fully equipped also with uh, solar power. Uh, then um, we can switch to wind power. That's a bit more difficult because obviously, you know, our plants are not that big that we could uh, put like uh, wind power uh, on there. Uh, but we're currently researching shareholding in wind power projects. Or conversely, in Malaysia, we are researching um, contribution to hydropower. So that would lead to a decrease well, for solar power minus 17.8. And uh, for wind power minus 19.3% uh, of COE2. Next one would be uh, manufacturing optimization, uh, like further increased usage of optimized materials. That would lead to reduction of CO2E by minus 4.6%. And lastly, uh, travel and transit optimization. So it means like remote solution for communication maintenance, e mobility, and better supply chain management. Um, and that could lead to minus 4.7 uh, CO2e. So within this complex here, we would have a maximum achievable reduction of 28.6%. And that is to say, if we were to switch to wind power and manufacturing optimization and travel and transit. So we can't do both here in this uh, case. So I took the um, higher one. Now let's look at scope three. All right. While Mosca actually already uses recycled materials beyond the industry standard, further improvements can be made. But these improvements or advancements, um, they depend very strongly on market acceptance on the customer side, but also on availability of recycled materials. So recycled materials are all the hype right now. Unfortunately, that leads to an increased, uh, increased um, demand of uh, recycled materials and they're getting more and more expensive. So if we advance in our usage of recycled materials, uh, we could reduce uh, our CO2E in scope three by 33.5%. Uh, then the next big thing is the usage of bioplastics. That is, um, I wouldn't say like a completely new trend, but it's a trend that's picking up. So it would be bioplastics um, instead of uh, virgin or crude oil based plastics. And we, we put like a lot of effort to this. Uh, we really want to understand how it works and how we can implement it in our factory. And, but again, this, uh, they're more expensive in, in the production, uh, on the production side of things. And uh, again, it uh, depends on whether our customer base is willing to consider that. Now, unfortunately, the real kicker here is bioplastics do not count as recycled plastics. So that means when there's a tax incentives and there's tax incentives for recycled materials, yeah? But these tax incentives do not apply to bioplastics, which in my eyes is total madness as of now. I hope this will change. And uh, this definitely requires lobbying with governmental bodies, uh, with association and such, right? 
So the maximum um, achievable reduction here is minus 53%. So if you, uh, if you pay attention, then uh, the total offset potential for us would be 81.6% if we fulfill um, all, the, all the different approaches um, I just showed you. But what about the rest? You know, whenever we produce anything, whenever we grow, there will be uh, um, increasing emissions. I mean, of course, we can, uh, we can try to you know, not have like a direct one-to-one uh, -one, uh, proportionality, but to reach actual carbon neutrality, or even positivity without terminating all operations and closing the companies, it will be necessary to offset the amount of residual CO2E emissions by contributing in other ways, possibly through for reforestation uh, projects, right? And in fact, uh, Mosca, um, we created a, a small biotope near our HQ in Germany where we created like perfect development conditions for the local flora and fauna. So this is something we already do. Um, another project with, uh, which I find um, very interesting is to contribute and invest in uh, renewable fuel projects. Um, last but not least, another interesting project is definitely uh, contributing to landfill gas capture projects. So you understand landfills, right? I mean, basically waste dumps and all the de decaying biomatter in there, they release gases. So of course, there's now companies building those um, gas capture plants on top of the uh, landfills to well, literally capture the gas and transform it into usable gas. And obviously the off offset here scales with our contribution to the uh, project in question. All right, now we're coming to strategy and implementation. So now I will present to you the findings within the Mosca group workshop. I was only like, what, uh, three or two weeks ago uh, regarding global sustainability approach. So basically we presented the experts advice to uh, the, uh, well, certain representatives of Mosca entities and the uh, sustainability committee. And yeah, we're just like, you know, it was a nice workshop. I uh, got some great new ideas out of it. And I just want to talk about those. So one, Kind of tricky question here was how or what can sales and service entities contribute right so on the internal side of things that's a no-brainer sustainable travel guidelines for sales and usage of the digital communication means so that goes hand in hand with the training of our sales force in terms of efficient use of teams skype and zoom easy one right Next one uh, is a bit more advanced, is uh, the usage of augmented reality, virtual reality, and remote solutions for servicing as first response. So you have to understand, right? We have a lot of machinery in the market, and in many cases, if the machine doesn't work, obviously the uh, then owner of the machine will call our guys in to fix the machine. Now, we plan to distribute AR goggles to their maintenance staff so they can put on the AR goggles and, you know, let's say it's a factory in Indonesia, uh, some guy in Germany can uh, guide them uh, through like how to identify the problem within the machine, uh, you know, what to change, what to check for and like have uh, remote diagnostics. In many cases, this actually helps uh, because most of the problems a machine encounters during the life cycle are quick fixes. If it turns out to be a bigger problem, then of course, uh, somebody from the nearest service station will probably make the trip over. And then next one, also an easy one, is go paperless. Yeah, easily said. Now, the thing is what I personally experience a lot uh, and what I wanna change is uh, statutory and legal documents, all right? Uh, if you want to uh, change board resolutions and whatnot, Basically, you need to print out uh, an original, have it notarized, send it across the planet to the next director. Uh, he has to sign and stamp, and then it goes on and on and on. And I, um, yeah, I want to introduce a nice little tool called DocuSign. Uh, it's digital signing with a verification system, so that verifies that the undersigning person is indeed the person they uh, they allegedly are. And this would really help us also with document movements. 
Now, and this is what I found really interesting actually when the sales and service entities uh, presented the ideas here on the external side, it's actually very logical. I didn't think of it. Uh, of course, the sales and service entities are responsible because they're the first contact point, they're responsible to communicate our brand and sustainability st statement towards customers, all right? They're the first entry point here. Uh, secondly, they have to demonstrate our minimum impact concept. They um, have to demonstrate our case studies. They have to demonstrate our best practice examples, especially in terms of TCO, total cost of ownership. Um, then, of course, externally again, Industry 4.0 or the Internet of Things, integration of small sensors across the machine that collect and transmit data to our servers. And then we have automated algorithms or in some, time, in some cases also manual determination of the machine state. And we can say, all right, so this motor already has, um, you know, doesn't, doesn't work that well anymore. So we see it coming that within the two or three next month, that will might be a service case there. So we can predict maintenance and therefore predict the trip ahead of time. Uh, and lastly, and that's a, that's a very cool little tool uh, we currently have programmed. It's a so-called CO2E material calculator, uh, including tax implications. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, I love this tool. All right. Don't pay too much attention to this table here. It's just um, how we get from like package uh, parameters and circumference, blah, 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 blah. How we get to the annual CO2 emission in tons for one of our production lines at our customer's place. All right, and this is like a very standard configuration you can see here on the left side. And this leads to an emission of almost 29 tons of CO2E a year. All right, uh, this tool is currently actually being peer reviewed and it will be uh, audited according to the ISO 14047, which is the life cycle assessment. So and then there's certain um, tax implications here. All right, because there's a three, um, three company, uh, sorry, three countries which already uh, implemented um, taxation on plastics. So in the UK, that's 200 sterling pounds per ton which in this scenario would be 5,800 pounds per year. Italy and Spain both stand at 450 euros a ton, and that would be already 13, uh, 13 grand euro per year. Now let's assume we have a, say, sorry, we have a uh, recycling ratio of 30% in the stuff we sell, in the scrap we sell. In the UK, the UK that already hits a threshold because they have a minimum 30% rule, then the companies there would be tax exempt completely. Slightly different case in Italy and in Spain, there the tax exemption really relates directly to the recycled ratio. So at the very least, if we were to offer a material with like a recycled ratio of 30%, our customers in Italy and Spain could save around 4,000 euros a year in tax. Now, again, I got to go back to the biomaterials. I'm a huge fan of that, you might have noticed by now. They have absolutely no effect. So I say association and government body lobbying is imperative. They have to be taken into account. All right, next one. Uh, what can production entities contribute? That's a little bit easier. So first up, we got energy management. Uh, as I said before, switch to photovoltaics to maximum extent. Uh, what's good for us, it's highly subsidized. Uh, deployment of e-saver solutions, that's a little bit more technical, but as you might or might not know, uh, in power grids, there are oftentimes energy spikes and they usually go unused, but these e-saver solutions, they detect the spikes, buffer them and release them once they're needed again. And then, of course, investment in renewable energy projects, hydro, wind, et cetera. And lastly, uh, energy workshops uh, and information exchange between in production entities to adopt best practices. All right. Then uh, for production entities, uh, production processes, reduce scrap through process efficiency, you know. 
uh, quite quite a simple approach, but definitely uh, can help contribute uh, to sustainability and increase the energy efficiency of our production lines. Reduce product weight while maintaining product performance. So in our case, as I said, right, we are producing plastic scraps and we're continuously looking into like, how can we change the physical properties of that to make the material lighter, to have less kilograms per uh, unit, but at the same time maintain the product performance which is needed in the market. So this actually, uh, yeah, is a big part of our r and process. And lastly, also ensure the longevity of our own production lines by Industry 4.0 by machine health monitoring and predictive maintenance. So it goes both ways. Not only do we look after our customers' machines, but also we have to look into our own production lines. And yes, I'm a stickler for that. Move the recycled or recyclable environment materials. Uh, the last part here uh, is, of course, compliance, due diligence, and SCM. So in terms of um, yeah, central control of compliance and due diligence, uh, we do have a risk management matrix uh, in terms of like supplier risk, uh, human rights risk. Um, we will conduct internal and external audits of policies and suppliers, and we will use these to carry our uh, sustainability statements out into the world through standardized contracts. Then, of course, the central control of supply chain management, optimize container movements, allotment, and combination of shipment routes, and therefore, again, help in sustainability. Uh, we will also use uh, logistics bidding platforms for benchmarking. And this is uh, kind of like um, Uber or any other uh, well, similar platform or, or app. So for logistics, you can say now there's like platforms where you can say we have 20 containers going from Malaysia to New Jersey, and then uh, different four borders and ocean liners can bid on that to combine the shipments um, as effectively as possible. And at the end of uh, strategy and implementation, of course, stands the release of our sustainability report and the introduction of a permanent sustainability committee. So Moscow's first really GRI, so it's a global uh, reporting initiative. The first GRI compliance sustainability report will be released in the first quarter of 2022. And then at the same time, uh, we will form the sustainability committee, which will be a permanent organ in our company, uh, consisting of the sustainability in the headquarters, the HR management also from the headquarters, uh, the compliance officer, reporting to me here in Singapore, the supply chain manager or global supply chain manager also uh, reporting to me in Singapore. And of course, representatives of the major hubs we, we have and the production sites. All right, so that was a uh, strategy and implementation. Now we jump to the bigger picture, politics and association uh, and the talking points and contradictions. I mean, you might've picked up on that a little bit in the previous parts. So first of all, let's talk taxation. So which body is actually responsible for taxation? Which means whose pocket does it go to? Is it the federal state? The state is the European Union? Well, right now for plastic tax, there's a EU directive, a European Union directive, not in place yet, but will be, uh, will be in place soon, I hope. And that will tax not the usage of non-recycled or single-use plastics at 800 euros per ton. But this will be imposed on countries within the EU. Now we have an initiative in the UK. Yes, I know, UK is not part of the EU anymore. And they will impose 200 sterling pounds per ton on imports if the recycling ratio is below 30%. So totally different concept. Spain and Italy, as mentioned before, their initiatives aim at 450 euro per ton imposed on processing companies. So from that, it already becomes clear that there are non-standardized approaches that might end in regulatory chaos. Now, the, back, um, the next thing is, um, how are all these texts currently being used or how do, um, you know, how do the bodies plan to use those? 
will it be filling gaps versus uh, allocating them for budgets dedicated to sustainability in R&D? Well, from this question, you can kind of guess right now, the plan is to use um, this additional tax <laughs> to level out or to, to fill in the gaps that uh, emerge from Brexit. Maybe not the best idea. All right, continue with taxation. How will CO2E emissions actually be audited? Which organ determines the CO2E emission in companies? Will there be a CO2E commissioner of Baden-Württemberg who goes into every company and like you know, measures the CO2E? How's that done? Based on which standards? There's different approaches, there's different outcomes, there are several standards. And aren't we even a bit late to start thinking about that in 2022? And back to my favorite topic, biomaterials. Biomaterials or bio-based plastics do not offset taxation. Where's the incentive? Where's the incentive for you know, innovate, innovative startups to actually put money into R&D to develop actual bio-based materials? All right, lastly, within this part, how do we overcome the overflow of associations? Now, there's a few, several very established associations, but also new associations, sustainability associations, are popping up, are popping up left, right, and center like mushrooms. And the question here is, which will prevail what happens to the other ones? And which association will actually be the leading one in setting the paradigms and standards? And my last talking point here would be circularity. So that means like closed loops, closed recycling loops. So yeah, we refer to that as circularity. How do we establish true circularity on a B2B level, right? I mean, even here in Asia where sustainability is not a big thing anyway, but even here in Singapore in particular, there will soon be a closed loop even on a B2B level for PET. But this is mostly because PET is collected on a large scale anyway, especially for consumers, think PET bottles. But what about all the other materials? There's so many plastic kinds which are being processed or being used up. What happens to those? Usually they end up in a landfill. So how do we do, how do we deal with those? Do we have to wait for another rather noble startup to you know, front some money to do this? And of course, one big thing, how do we ensure that no hidden agendas are being pushed or followed? Because mind you, uh, actually renewable plastics and biomaterials are quite a threat to oil companies. Think about it. So on my last slide, I want to get to your conclusions. And well, if you're actually interested, ask me anything. So my questions to you would be, where does all this leave us? Is it all just greenwashing? And lastly, is sustainability and CSR just PR and steroids? Thank you.